you've clicked on a YouTube video to find out about the Dark Lord Diablo. Well, stay a while and listen. Explaining entertainment, keeping you ahead of the culture curve, it's not just on Disney, it's not just on movies, it's not just on streaming. Now we cover everything that should be fun here on the WDW Pro channel, and that includes video games for sure. Many people do not realize the breadth of the industry that is video gaming uh, larger than the movie industry, and uh, we've just seen a fantastic game in Hogwarts Legacy come out, place itself firmly in one of the top 10 slots of all time, probably going to be a top five. We'll find out as those older consoles and the Nintendo Switch gain access to the game. But there is another potential big game on the horizon, this one having just entered into an open beta on multiple platforms, that being Diablo 4. It is an extremely popular franchise, a genre-setting franchise for many of its iterations. However, it is also developed and produced by a company that has had a fall from grace. Perhaps Blizzard Entertainment is the Disney of the video game industry. Once fully staffed by utter geniuses like David Brevik, Mark Kern, and more, the company has seen an exodus of high-level talent and has uh, moved on from some of their uh, genre-defining classics to well, more average fare, although it still continues to be quite polished. Now, joining me to talk about everything Diablo 4 and Blizzard, we have Caffeinated Wolf. Wolf, welcome back. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to be here. And we also have the artist behind all of those beautiful thumbnails and all of the art assets, not only for my channel, but also for Valiant Renegade and... Uh, quite the gaming streamer that you should be checking out. Fat Steven, welcome back yet again. Thank you for having me. And uh, I have one question. You guys do have phones, right? <laughs> Don't you that guys have That in reference to the Diablo Immortal. Yes, the Diablo. Mm -hmm. that, that is infamous is when they did the uh, Diablo Immortal, that being the mobile game version of Diablo. When they brought that out to BlizzCon. Does anybody remember which year that was? Was that 2019, maybe? I think it was the year they got owned. Yeah, well... By Red that, so, yes, yes, Red Shirt guy. And uh, that, that was one of the worst PR faux pas ever. But uh, it was, it was well-deserved. They came out and presented the most casual game possible to a crowd that was expecting to see something hardcore and fabulous and then essentially ridiculed the audience. So, yeah, I guess that's what you deserve when you bring something like that out to your biggest fans. And it also needs to be said that Diablo Immortal was... Uh, combined in efforts with uh, a developer out of China, NetEase, I believe is the name of that one. And uh, it was essentially, I suppose, a game designed to just extract as much money as possible out of people with addiction problems. Wolf, is that your understanding? Uh, it's not only my understanding. That's just factual is what that's that right. is. The, the, the Asian gaming market is, is heavily focused on mobile gaming and... As anybody who's familiar with the gaming industry knows, mobile gaming is heavily leaned towards or skewed towards free-to-play, pay-to-win after a certain point. And Diablo Immortal was rife with that. You can play a little ways into the game without spending any money, and then once you reach a certain point, you're wanting to do some real progression, you've got to drop some serious money. And the, the loot system that they had for it was out of this world, one of the worst in, like, microtransaction history for gaming. Sure. And, and, and there were give... people that streamed dropping tens of thousands of dollars on the game just to show you how bad it was. Right, that's what I was going to say, to give people an idea, because there may be people watching this video who just don't know what we're talking about when we're, you know, saying... They, they, they may think, well, you know, these guys are talking about hundreds of dollars, and that's really bad. No. no. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars like if you were someone... Yeah. So, Stephen, you've been playing Diablo 4 now. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with the beta. What do you think of it? How does it compare to Diablo 3, Diablo 2, Diablo 1? Where does this land? 
Oh, the first impressions I had with the beta was um, it took half an hour to 45 minutes just to log in because everyone was trying to log in on the free weekend. Uh, that's where I got my chance. Uh, secondly, there was enough content to keep you interested. And by the end, I do think it was a success. There is a lot of things that you, you can never really compare anything, I think, to Diablo 2. I think that's the perfect game to a lot of people. Uh, the same way Diablo 1 was the introduction to that whole world and that whole genre, which not only built friendships, it, it built a long-lasting tradition with people. So, Stephen, uh, tell me, what's the special sauce about Diablo 2? Because right? I hear this from so many people, and I've played it as well. What makes it different than the newer versions of Diablo? For Diablo, th for Diablo 4? Yeah, was, what, what, what is different between Diablo 2 and then 3 and 4, which have had a distinctly different flavor to them? To be honest, it feels like they're dumbing it down and trying to keep it simpler. Um, I've seen across the board on the YouTube people complaining about the font not being um, um, evil enough to they don't understand why they have a, the, the power level score on the armors. And it's it's mixed for me. It's mixed. When I went in there, I tried a necromancer. I customized my character. I got in. It got in. I didn't feel overwhelmed. It was. It would jump from story to cinematics. The voice work was great. The everything about the audio was great. I don't realize that I'm wasting three hours. It still is Diablo. It still is an ARPG, but it's not what I think people are going by based off they're expecting. They're expecting more. They're expecting forgiveness in another Diablo 2 or another Diablo 3, and I don't think it's there yet. So, Wolf, uh, one of the things that Blizzard was known for was defining whatever genre they entered into. Now, of course, in so many of their games, they took those genres and simplified it to a level that casuals could get in. But in the best situations with Blizzard, they also had such a high skill ceiling that the, the very best players in the world then could excel in ways that others could not. That seems to have diminished in most recent titles where it's very easy to get into the game, but it's also capped at the top of the skill ceiling at sort of a low level where you really can't uh, be drastically better than someone else. And that tends to go to this monetization idea of uh, that you, you want people to max out at a low ceiling so that then they're forced to pay money to get better. What do you think about Diablo 4 and monetization? What do you think about Diablo 4 in terms of the wider industry? Is this going to be the kind of game that sets new standards, that uh, creates new innovations in the genre? Or are we into a, a new pattern where Blizzard just fits the, the mold? Well, that, the, the ball's really in Blizzard's court at this point with that. And they have an opportunity here because when Diablo 3 launched, a lot of long-time Diablo players had major issues with it. It felt dumbed down in a lot of respects to long-time Diablo 1 and 2 players. It had massive issues with its marketplace. Now, in terms of they, they wound up correcting that later on, at least to a, enough of a substantial degree where players were happy with it overall. But in terms of Diablo 4 and its potential, it really depends on how much the current dev team there, and I guess... Even, more so because it's actually it comes down from the top it's more the publisher what they're dictating um in terms of how they want to handle the monetization we just saw a massive we just touched on this the diablo immortal debacle was insane for them and people were pretty po'd and rightfully so as far as um how successful this game can be it depends on what they decide to learn from with their last two iterations of the game and they have an opportunity to do something really fantastic. The issue right now that we see, it, that you touched on for a second there, was that we have in recent years, and Blizzard is definitely guilty of this especially, we've seen many game developers start to oversimplify and dumb down their game franchises to appeal more to casuals, to appeal more to the lowest common denominator, and that's people that aren't actually hardcore gamers. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Elden Ring from last year did so well with gamers, but your typical normies and game journos from Kotaku were just all up in arms about, oh, game's too hard, game needs an easy mode. They, 
the disparity between skill level is an important distinction when it comes to players. Like, you, you either choose to put in the time to learn the mechanics of the game, and Diablo classically has very in-depth mechanics that are worthwhile learning for somebody who really wants to get into the game. Whether or not they choose to keep that moving forward is entirely on them, and that will determine, I think, the game's ultimate success, because Diablo is... It, that's not a casual game. That's not a normie game. Casuals don't play Diablo. Casuals play Call of Duty. Sure. Now, you bring up a lot of really good points, and I, I want to key in on this uh, this distinction between the normal casual players and then the hardcore dedicated fans who really love Diablo. In particular, I have been struck by the entertainment websites, the gaming journalists, and I use that phraseology very lightly, but uh, in looking at their take on the game, I think it's almost completely based on them wanting to bolster Blizzard and gain access to Blizzard, continue getting those free uh, perks that come along with being a uh, low-paid journalist. But if you look at all of the, the various things across Google News, I mean, it's just, it's utter, complete, total praise coming from them towards Diablo 4. At the same time, then, I go and I look at some of the top streamers and top uh, YouTubers when it comes to this genre. You know, I, I'm looking at, uh, at streamers like Gold and seeing that they have some major criticisms, some major critiques, and they tend to have their finger on the pulse of the gaming community quite a bit better, I would say, than these other publications. Stephen, what do you make of the, the criticisms we've seen so far in regards to Diablo 4? Do you think that the game could have a short shelf life because of some of these flaws they're talking about? And some of the top level uh, commentators, and again, we're not talking about games journalists. I'm not sure that they have that kind of pedigree. But some of the top it. level are even saying that this should be delayed. What say you? I think their their complaints are all valid. Uh, I've seen quite a few about repetitive dungeons that it doesn't really feel like it's procedural. Because if let's let's take. Path of Exile, for example, with their dungeons and backtracking, everything feels different each time you go in. It's not the same. With the well, why do you think it feels so similar? Or why do you think it feels so monotonous and, and not differentiated? I think that uh, Blizzard's idea of um, procedural dungeons is just a playlist on shuffle. Well, rather that's than such a shame because Diablo 1 and Diablo 2 were tremendous. And they're, what, 20, 25 years old now? And they, mm -hmm. they did it wonderfully. I think at the end of the day, it, it matters who's on the team developing this, if they are listening to fans, if they're going to address the buffs and the nerfs for each characters, because there's also things like it, it's open world. You're going to see other random players playing and doing world events or world bosses, and you're going to wonder why one person is killing faster than you are, and it just depends on their class and their skill setup. It's going to be different for a lot of people, but when I ran this game, it was fun. But I also felt like I was just tapping the screen on a mobile game and just mashing oh, that's, away. That's and a bad I, criticism. That's, I, that's I, not no, good. No, but that's normal, right? Because I'm also playing on controller. And yes, you're going to be spamming one skill over and over as your mana gets recharged or your essence gets recharged. But it, No, it but, uh, but what I'm talking about, though, is when, you, when you're playing a game with whatever console it might be on or whatever platform, whether it's PC or Xbox One X or PlayStation, whatever it is, the minute that you think, oh, this is a lot like a mobile game, that's a red flag. I mean, that's a major red flag. Um, yeah. Yeah, Stephen, tell us a little bit about the classes. Which classes have you had a chance to play as so far? Actually, I dived in with Necromancer, and I felt like that was kind of OP, because as you level up, uh, first then I have four skeleton guys fighting for me. They can change their perk setups. And then I had three skeletal mages joining on well, so I had like a whole party of like eight people, including myself, running around just killing stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, well, I, I think I have heard that uh, Necromancer does seem to be the most powerful class right now. Although that's a balance issue. They can straighten that out. But did it feel like there was a good synchronicity with all the abilities? Did you feel like there was a good flow? For what I played, yeah. But then again, I'm more of a path person than I am a Diablo person. I can say one thing. You, you will dive in. You'll create your character. You'll get a cutscene. You'll then start playing, and then he'll start giving you the story. And the way they're delivering your character throughout the story and the dialogue, it will grab you. 
it depends on how much attention and how much of the end game they're going to give us that will keep us wanting to keep doing the repetitive play, right? And I think that's where it's going to cause a lack. The world map might be huge, everything might look pretty, but it, if it doesn't have a soul, you're not going to maintain players, and that's what I feel like it's going to happen with this one. Well, let, let's let's examine that a little bit further. Wolf, uh, the first two Diablos, which were, I mean, just tremendously received. Oh, my gosh. I mean, people love that's Diablo a- 1 and Diablo 2 up until this day. But they're not pretty games, and that's by design. Do you think that Blizzard is still missing the mark when it comes to what Diablo should be and Maybe now there's going to be more years and more fans who are accustomed to this more colorful, I don't know how you describe the, the new version of Diablo, but it, it's not the same as the first two, which felt very isolated, horror-esque. And, I, you know, the first time that players encountered the butcher, you know, when he uh, yells oh, out God. fresh meat. Yeah, that was something. I don't <laughs> see those something moments in, in this game. You make a great point, and uh, I'll go to this. Uh, there was when you're doing, um, like, say, the dungeons or these random places where you go in, and then you have to find a key, or you have to find a cube, or you have to find a sphere, and then unlock the door, and you face the boss. It all has the same kind of feel. You do this, you enter this big area. It's like it's like Destiny when you know it's coming to a boss area, or Elden Ring where you know it's coming to an open boss area, and then it's just spam your buttons, avoid the damage. It, it, it mm. I don't want to. I don't want to hate on it, but it it literally felt like I was. I, I could have just had a duck slamming the button on my controller the whole time, going up and down with water. It, it didn't. Well, feel why, like it, why do you think this is that Blizzard has shifted away from from that level of creativity they once had? What's happened? Because I think that they, in some way, shape, or form, believe that they found their identity within that kind of colorful sort of. Uh, comic book brought to life cell shaded graphical style that became a big thing with world of warcraft um and so the massive amount of successes they saw with wow they carried that forward into diablo 3 and while tweaking it slightly you can still see parallels and design influences from those games even up through something like overwatch and so sure. i think that they have decided that that's the visual style that they're going to go with. And I think that's fine, but where they have the potential to lose people is what Steven touched on, which is the gameplay. Is the gameplay hook going to be sufficient enough to where it's going to kind of overshadow um, the rapidity, the, the repetitiousness of the gameplay? Because Diablo is a repetitive game by its very nature. But when it comes to games like that, you have to be very careful to not make that repetition turn into monotony because there's a difference. Anybody that's played any kind of RPG, whether it's an MMO, an action RPG, or otherwise, knows that repetition is just part of the thing. It's There's going to be a grind, and more often than not, there's going to be a lot of it in order for you to reach the, the point in your gameplay that you really want to get to in terms of you know, your your skill tree, your stats, your gear, all of that. There's grinding throughout all of that, but you have to have a hook that makes that feel worthwhile, that reminds the player, this is why I'm doing this. This is still fun, even if I'm doing more or less the same thing for quite a few hours on end. And that's something that they lost with some of their recent games, um, not counting the monetization issues with Diablo Immortal. But that was one of the issues early on with Diablo 3. So it really depends on how they leverage the gameplay. They, they have to remind players what the hook is, and that hook has to be sufficient to carry them through the grind. Because grind and uh, RPG, you can't really separate the two. They're, they're concomitant. You're going to get one, you're going to get the other. Gotcha. So I, I want to wrap up uh, our conversation with something that, might be a little contentious. And before we started this video, Wolf and I were discussing that we should all judge Diablo 4 based on its merits when it comes out, which I believe the month is June is when that's going to release. June but 6th, um, right. yeah, so but I I do want to address a market issue with this game. And the market issue is that there are a number of people who, just as in the uh, movie and streaming sphere, people have come to 
a level of disgust, honestly, with Disney, so too Blizzard has earned that. And Blizzard may be a few years ahead in that cycle or in that progression of making people dislike them. Just to run through some of the things that Blizzard has done, they punished a player, a professional player, for expressing support for democracy in a, a, a location. They fired all of the esports uh, participants, players, uh, professionals in Heroes of the Storm directly before Christmas. And they have just done a number of things that are uh, unpleasant. We talked about Diablo Immortal. We, uh, we could go on and on with the things that, that Blizzard has done. I'm, I'm not going to say some of them, uh, although if you'd like to find out, go look up why they changed the name for Jesse McCree in Overwatch. He will Let's just say be that <laughs> yes, always be McCree, McCree. That's exactly right. But um, but they have a very sordid history in the last even ten years. But I'm curious how much that's going to hurt the game. I'm curious if perhaps people will have less goodwill, and if it comes out with mixed reviews or it's buggy or what have you. I, I wonder if now Blizzard is in a position where players will say, "No, I'm not going to give them the the benefit of the doubt. They're not going to get my money." Stephen, do you think that is a significant impact, or do you believe that this is the new shiny thing and people will just give the new shiny thing lots and lots of money? I think it's both. It depends how many players are attached based off their emotion level, how many scars are, are left, and how many people just want to dive in and play with their friends and play Diablo, a new Diablo. It just just play. That depends. I guess that's where it falls down. Um, they are also going to be having a battle pass that they say is not going to be pay to win. It's going to be on just about cosmetics, but wait to see how that releases because Blizzard has that track record as well. Um, I, I have to say both. I think it's all going to be up to the players. And from there, the popular streamers who are going to be probably watched the most, they'll be the nay or yay on the lifespan of this game. You know, I know that uh, the teams that work on these games are different, but I will tell you that the Overwatch Battle Pass, I have not been impressed with at all whatsoever. No, so. I deleted Overwatch. I, uh, their Battle Passes are absolute trash. It's not worth it. Fortnite outranks them when it comes to a Battle Pass system, and Blizzard should learn from that. Or at least keep the loot boxes. You can earn another way, but don't charge money for them. And I think that's where they no. have messed up with that community. Through, through incompetence, they've managed to kill... Well, through incompetence, they've managed to kill both mm -hmm. Overwatch and Heroes of the Storm. Uh, I think Overwatch is headed for the Heroes of the Storm treatment because I think they have just... They have not been uh, quick to respond to what needs to be done with the game, and it's clear that they don't understand what that game is. I hope that they can do better with Diablo 4, where they at least understand their own game they've created. Wolf, where do you see this game placing itself in terms of market reception? I think uh, I think you and Steven kind of hit the nail on the head for the most part there. I think this is going to come down to how much of an attachment the player is going to have towards it. I will say this. Um, any piece of uh, objective media should be judged as such for its own merits. However, ultimately, when that piece of media, however good it may be in some regards, if it is being developed by a company who has kind of spurned and uh, vilified or just done wrong their player base for X amount of time, when that game ultimately has issues, whether they're minor, mid, or major, those players are going to be far less forgiving about those issues, and they are going to act on them, I think, far more visibly. And in a lot of cases, that's with the wallet. We've seen that happen with games. And we've seen how a lot of games that used to have big names attached to them, uh, Halo Infinite, just kind of die. And, and that's, that's earned in a lot of cases. It's absolutely earned. And so Diablo 4 could end up being the best in the franchise. But because Blizzard has done their player base wrong multiple times in a row now, including with this specific franchise, if the players ultimately are like, you know what? Nah. Then, I mean, sure, you, you made a good game, but you also ticked off your player base for far too long that it didn't ultimately matter. You don't, 
you only get so many chances in the eyes of the consumer. Excellent points all. I agree with everything you both have said. Can I Stephen, add one? May yeah, I have go one for thing? it. Um, I, I just want to piggyback off Andrew here, and I think this is another great point. Um, corporations and companies like Blizzard or EA or anyone else out there can no longer hide behind the title of their game, the franchise name, whether it's a Call of Duty, a Hearthstone, a Diablo, or a Warcraft. Just because you put it on a turd and say it's something new does not mean it's not the same turd with a new piece of plastic. They have to do better and they have to do more to entice players. Live service is great, but a lot of players are getting sick of it. Battle passes are great, but it better make the battle pass worthwhile. You can't keep looking at everyone who plays your game or wants to play your game as nothing more than a dollar sign. We see this the same thing going on with Disney and Marvel and DC. Cash signs out and start listening. And I think that's where it needs to start. And Blizzard has a long way to go because they pretty much ruined their company in three years. Right? Power to the consumers, power to the players. Stephen, where can people find you on this great, big, beautiful web out there? Uh, probably at a Domino's Pizza wondering why I'm not streaming. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll have the description down there if you all want Thank to you. find Stephen streaming in a Domino's. Wolf, where can people find you? You can find me streaming over on twitch.tv slash Wolf. You can find me over on Twitter. And you can find me every Tuesday night on World Class BS. I'm one of the co-hosts of High Council. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here and helping us break down a big game coming up. We'll see how the market reacts. Will consumers give Blizzard one more chance, or are we already on a bumpy road that signals big-time problems for Diablo up ahead? Wherever you are, folks, keep learning, keep growing, and keep having fun. Make sure to catch The Pro Show, Thursdays, 5 to 7 Eastern Time. Entertainment Explained, The Culture Curve Conquered, live with Pro and all his friends.